Hello listeners, this is the reading of the Sabbath School lesson for the fourth and final quarter of 2022. The series is titled On Death, Dying and the Future Hope. The author is Dr. Alberto Tim, while your readers are Percy and Sibylla Harold. Welcome to lesson number nine, titled Contrary Passages. It's ready for teaching. Sabbath afternoon, November 19. Before we start, let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, once again we come to your word and we just thank you for it. We praise you for who you are, the creator of this vast universe that extends in so many directions, but also the one who created this earth that we are actually living on right now and for creating us. We just thank you so much, and we owe so much to you, because we are not worthy of your love, your grace, and your help. And as we open your word this week, we pray that your Holy Spirit will guide us. As we look at some difficult texts, we pray that we may see clearly where truth lies and where error lies, and also how we can, with this knowledge, be able to help others around us. And today I'd like to pray, particularly for those who are listening from Harvey Bay in Australia, from Bogota in Colombia, for Alex- those in Alexandria in Egypt and Cape Town in South Africa and Calgary in Alberta and Frankfurt in Germany and Tauranga in New Zealand and Jakarta in Indonesia and Hyderabad in India. Lord, wherever we're listening, we pray that your Holy Spirit will be with us. And not only that, but that this week we will know that we have walked with Jesus. Bless us now as we open your word, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Our memory text this week is John chapter 5 and verse 39. You search the scriptures, for in them you think you have eternal life, and they are they which testify of me. Let's read that again. You search the scriptures, for in them you think you have eternal life, and these are they which testify of me. John 5, 39. Peter warns us, always be ready to give a defence to everyone who asks you a reason for the hope that is in you. 1 Peter 3 verse 15. Paul adds, preach the word. Be ready in season and out of season. Convince, rebuke, exhort with all long suffering and teaching. For the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine. 2 Timothy chapter 4 verses 2 and 3. This being the case, we should look not only at those passages that easily can be explained to fit our beliefs, but also at passages that are commonly used to teach something different from what we believe. As we do, we should follow the inspiring example of Jesus, as Ellen White writes in The Desire of Ages, page 353. Christ himself did not suppress one word of truth, but He spoke it always in love. He was never rude, never needlessly spoke a severe word, never gave needless pain to a sensitive soul. He did not censure human weakness. This week, we will study some intriguing passages that people use to justify the natural immortality of the soul. These reflections should strengthen our own convictions and help us to answer kindly those who question this crucial teaching. Sunday, November 20, The Rich Man and Lazarus. Read Luke chapter 16, verses 19 to 31. Why is this story not a literal description of the afterlife? Let's begin in Luke 16 at verse 19. There was a certain man who was clothed in purple and fine linen and fared sumptuously every day. But there was a certain beggar named Lazarus, full of sores, who was laid at the gate, 
desiring to be fed with the crumbs which fell from the rich man's table. Moreover, the dogs came and licked his sores. So it was that the beggar died and was carried by the angels to Abraham's bosom. The rich man also died and was buried, and being in torments in Hades, he lifted up his eyes and saw Abraham afar off and Lazarus in his bosom. Then he cried and said, Father Abraham, have mercy on me and send Lazarus, that he may dip the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue, for I am tormented in this flame. But Abraham said, Son, remember that in your lifetime you received your good things, and likewise Lazarus evil things, but now he is comforted and you are tormented. And besides all this, between us and you there is a great gulf fixed, so that those who want to pass from here to you cannot, nor can those from there pass to us. Then he said, I beg you therefore, Father, that you would send him to my father's house, for I have five brothers, that he may testify to them, lest they also come to this place of torment. Abraham said to him, They have Moses and the prophets, let them hear them. And he said, No, Father Abraham, but if one goes to them from the dead, they will repent. But he said to him, If they do not hear Moses and the prophets, neither will they be persuaded, though one rise from the dead. Some scholars have suggested that Luke 16, 19 to 31 should be interpreted literally, that is, as describing the state of the dead. But this view would lead to several unbiblical conclusions and would contradict many of the passages that we have already looked at. First, we would have to admit that heaven and hell are close enough to allow a conversation between the dwellers of both places, as we just saw in those verses 23 to 31. We also would have to suppose that in the afterlife, while the body lies in the grave, there remains a conscious form of the spiritual soul with eyes, a finger and a tongue, and which even feels thirst, as we saw in verses 23 and 24. If this passage were a description of the human state in death, then heaven would certainly not be a place of joy and happiness, because the saved could closely follow the endless sufferings of their lost loved ones and even dialogue with them, as we saw in this story. How could a mother be happy in heaven while beholding the incessant agonies of her beloved child in hell? In such a context, it would be virtually impossible for God's promise of no more sorrow, crying and pain to be fulfilled, as we read in Revelation 21 verse 4, and God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. There shall be no more death, nor sorrow, nor crying. There shall be no more pain, for the former things have passed away. Because of such incoherence, many biblical scholars regard the story of the rich man and Lazarus as a parable from which not every detail can be interpreted literally. George E. Ladd, though not an Adventist, certainly sounds like one here when he says that this story was probably, and here's a quote, a parable which made use of current Jewish thinking and is not intended to teach anything about the state of the dead. And that's from Eschatology in the New Bible Dictionary, page 388. The parable of the rich man and Lazarus presents a sharp contrast between a well-dressed rich man and a certain beggar named Lazarus full of sores. We read that in verses 19 and 20 of chapter 16 of Luke. The account teaches that one, status and social recognition in the present are not the criteria for the future reward, and two, the eternal destiny of each person is decided in this life and cannot be reversed 
in the afterlife, as we read in verses 25 and 26. But Abraham said, Son, remember that in your lifetime you received your good things, and likewise Lazarus evil things. But now he is comforted, and you are tormented. And besides all this, between us and you there is a great gulf fixed, so that those who want to pass from here to you cannot, nor can those from there pass to us. And so to finish the day. But he said to them, If they do not hear Moses and the prophets, neither will they be persuaded, though one rise from the dead. That was verse 31. What message from Jesus' powerful words should we take for ourselves regarding the authority of the Bible and how we respond to it? Monday, November 21. Today, with me in paradise. One of the Bible passages most widely used to try to prove the immortality of the soul is Luke 23, verse 43. He replied, Truly, I tell you, today you will be with me in paradise. Almost all Bible versions, with few exceptions, translate this text in a similar way, giving the impression that on the very day Christ died, Christ and the thief would be together in paradise. This should not surprise us because those translations were made by biblical scholars who believe in the dogma of the natural immortality of the soul. But is this the best translation of the text? Compare Luke 23 verse 43 with John 20 verse 17 and John 14 verses 1 to 3. How should the promise of the repentant thief on the cross be understood in light of Jesus' words to Mary Magdalene and his promise to his disciples? Luke 23 and verse 43. And Jesus said to him, Assuredly, I say to you, today you will be with me in paradise. And John 20, verse 17, Jesus said to her, Do not cling to me, for I have not yet ascended to my Father, but go to my brethren and say to them, I am ascending to my Father and your Father, and to my God and your God. And John 14, beginning at verse 1, Let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you, and if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you to myself, that where I am, there you may be also. The assumption that Christ and the thief went on that same day to paradise or heaven contradicts Jesus' words to Mary Magdalene after his resurrection, which affirms that he had not yet gone to the presence of his Father in heaven, as we read in John 20 verse 17. This error, that both Jesus and the repentant thief went to heaven that day also contradicts Jesus' promise to his disciples that they would be taken to heaven only at his second coming in John 14 verses 1 to 3. The issue in Luke 23:43 is whether the adverb today, the Greek word semeron, S-E-M-E-R-O-N, should be linked to the verb that follows it, to be, or to the verb that precedes it, To tell, Wilson Poroshi recognises that from the grammatical standpoint it is virtually impossible to determine the correct alternative. He writes in The Ministry Magazine, June 2003, page 7, titled The Significance of a Comma, an Analysis of Luke 23, 43. And he writes, Luke, however has a definite tendency of using this adverb with the preceding verb. This happens in 14 of the 20 occurrences of Semeron in Luke and Acts. End of quote. So, 
The most natural reading of Luke 23.43 would be, Truly I tell you today, you will be with me in paradise. In this case, the idiomatic expression, I tell you today, emphasises the relevance and solemnity of the statement, you will be with me in paradise. In short, Jesus was promising him right then and there that he would be saved. And so to finish the day, read the story of the repentant thief in Luke 23, 39-43, who despite his sin, despite the fact that he had nothing to offer God, was promised eternal life by Christ. Luke 23, beginning at verse 39, Then one of the criminals who was hanged blasphemed him, saying, If you are the Christ, save yourself and us. But the other, answering, rebuked him, saying, Do you not even fear God, seeing you are under the same condemnation? And we indeed justly, for we receive the due reward of our deeds. But this man has done nothing wrong. Then he said to Jesus, Lord, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And Jesus said to him, Assuredly, I say to you today, you will be with me in paradise. How does this story powerfully reveal the great truth of salvation by faith alone? In what ways are we just like that thief? In what ways do we differ? Tuesday, November 22, to depart and be with Christ. Read Philippians chapter 1, verses 21 to 24, and 1 Thessalonians 4, 13 to 18. When did Paul expect to be with Christ, as he said in Philippians 1, 23, and with the Lord in 1 Thessalonians 4, verse 17? Philippians 1, beginning at verse 21, For to me, to live is Christ, and to die is gain. But if I live on in the flesh, this will mean fruit from my labour. Yet what I shall choose I cannot tell, for I am hard-pressed between the two, having a desire to depart and be with Christ, which is far better. Nevertheless, to remain in the flesh is more needful for you. And 1 Thessalonians 4, beginning at verse 13. But I do not want you to be ignorant, brethren, concerning those who have fallen asleep, lest you sorrow as others who have no hope. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so God will bring with him those who sleep in Jesus. For this we say to you by the word of the Lord, that we who are alive and remain until the coming of the Lord will by no means precede those who are asleep. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel and with the trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. Then we who are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and thus we shall always be with the Lord. Therefore comfort one another with these words. Paul was driven with the passion to live in Christ now, as we read in 2 Corinthians 5.17. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. All things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. And with Christ, after his second coming, as we just read in 1 Thessalonians 4 verse 17, Then we who are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and thus we shall always be with the Lord. For the Apostle, not even death could break the assurance of belonging to his Saviour and Lord. And he said in the epistle to the Romans, Neither death nor life, can separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord, in Romans 8, verses 38 and 39. For if we live, 
we read in Romans 14, 8, if, For if we live, we live to the Lord, and if we die, we die to the Lord. Therefore, whether we live or die, we are the Lord's. With this certainty in mind, Paul spoke of the believers who already had died as those who sleep in Jesus. In verse 14 of 1 Thessalonians 4, For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so God will bring with him those who sleep in Jesus, and who will be raised at Christ's second coming to receive eternal life. Now we read that in 1 Corinthians 15 verses 16 to 18. And that reads, For if the dead do not rise, then Christ is not risen. And if Christ is not risen, your faith is futile. You are still in your sins. Then also those who have fallen asleep in Christ have perished. And 1 Thessalonians 4, 13 to 18. Let's read that again. But I do not want you to be ignorant, brethren, concerning those who have fallen asleep, lest you sorrow as others who have no hope. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so God will bring with him those who sleep in Jesus. For this we say to you by the word of the Lord, that we who are alive and remain until the coming of the Lord will by no means precede those who are asleep. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel and with the trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. Then we, who are alive and remain, shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and thus we shall always be with the Lord. Therefore, comfort one another with these words. When Paul mentioned his desire to depart and be with Christ in Philippians 1 verse 23, For I am hard-pressed between the two, having a desire to depart and be with Christ, which is far better. Did he imply that after death his soul would depart to live consciously with Christ? Not at all. In this text, as we read in the Andrews Study Bible, page 1555, in the note on Philippians 1.23, Paul verbalises his desire to leave this present troubled existence and be with Christ, without reference to any lapse of time that may occur between the two events. This verse does not teach that Paul expected to go to heaven at death. He was very clear that he would not receive his reward until the second coming, as we read in 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 8. Finally, there is laid up for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will give to me on that day, and not to me only, but also to all who have loved his appearing. End of quote. In short, Paul is saying that the next thing he would know after departing death would be Christ coming in the clouds of heaven to raise the dead when he would be with the Lord, as we read in 1 Thessalonians 4.17. It also should be noted that the Bible writers at times refer to two events together that may be separated by a long period of time. And that concludes the quote from the Andrew Study Bible, page 1555. But why would Paul prefer to die than to live? because then he could finally rest from all his troubles without needing any longer to suffer pain in his body. As we read in 1 Corinthians chapter 9 and verse 27, But I discipline my body and bring it into subjection, lest when I have preached to others, I myself should become disqualified. And he would do so with the full certainty that he would receive the crown of righteousness at the second coming, as expressed in 2 Timothy 4, verses 6 to 8. And that reads, For I am already being poured out as a drink offering, 
and the time of my departure is at hand. I have fought the good fight, I have finished the race, I have kept the faith. Finally, there is laid up for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will give to me on that day, and not to me only, but also to all who have loved his appearing. Though Paul certainly didn't want to die, he knew what would follow when he did. And so to finish today, particularly in hard times, who hasn't thought about how nice it would be to close your eyes in death and the next thing you know, be with Christ? How does this thought help us understand what Paul was saying in Philippians? Wednesday, November 23, Preaching to the Spirits in Prison. Read 1 Peter chapter 3, verses 13 to 20. How did Christ preach to the spirits in prison in the days of Noah? 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 13. And who is he who will harm you if you will become followers of what is good? But even if you should suffer for righteousness' sake, you are blessed. And do not be afraid of their threats, nor be troubled. But sanctify the Lord God in your hearts, and always be ready to give a defence to everyone who asks you a reason for the hope that is in you, with meekness and fear, having a good conscience that when they defame you as evildoers, those who revile your good conduct in Christ may be ashamed." For it is better, if it is the will of God, to suffer for doing good than for doing evil. For Christ also suffered once for sins, the just for the unjust, that he might bring us to God, being put to death in the flesh, but made alive by the Spirit, by whom also he went and preached to the spirits in prison, who formerly were disobedient, when once the divine long-suffering waited in the days of Noah, while the ark was being prepared, in which a few, that is, eight souls, were saved through water. And we'll compare that with Genesis 4 verse 10. And he said, What have you done? The voice of your brother's blood cries out to me from the ground. Commentators who believe in the natural immortality of the soul usually point out that Christ preached to the spirits in prison, as we've just read in 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 19, while he was still resting in the tomb. For them, his disincarnated spirit went into hell and preached to the disembodied spirits of the antediluvians. Yet, this fanciful notion is biblically unacceptable because there is no second opportunity of salvation for the dead, as you read in Hebrews 9, 27 and 28. And as it is appointed for men to die once, but after this the judgment, so Christ was offered once to bear the sins of many. To those who eagerly wait for him, he will appear a second time apart from sin for salvation. So why would Jesus preach to those who had no more chance of salvation? Meanwhile, and most important, this theory contradicts the biblical teaching that the dead remain unconscious in the grave until the final resurrection. Let's look at Job chapter 14 verses 10 to 12. But man dies and is laid away. Indeed, he breathes his last. And where is he? As water disappears from the sea, and a river becomes parched and dries up, so man lies down and does not rise, till the heavens are no more. They will not awake, nor be roused from their sleep. And Psalm 146 verse 4. His spirit departs, he returns to his earth. In that very day his plans perish. And Ecclesiastes chapter 9 verses 5. For the living know that they will die, but the dead know nothing, and they have no more reward, for the memory of them is forgotten. And verse 10, 
Whatever your hand finds to do, do it with your might, for there is no work or device or knowledge or wisdom in the grave where you are going. And 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 16 to 18, For if the dead do not rise, then Christ is not risen. And if Christ is not risen, your faith is futile, you are still in your sins. Then also those who have fallen asleep in Christ have perished. And 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verses 13 to 15, But I do not want you to be ignorant, brethren, concerning those who have fallen asleep, lest you sorrow as others who have no hope. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so God will bring with him those who sleep in Jesus. For this we say to you by the word of the Lord, that we who are alive and remain until the coming of the Lord will by no means precede those who are asleep. Also, if this verse were really saying that Jesus, while bodily in the tomb, went down to hell and preached to the wicked antediluvians, why did only they hear his message? Were not other lost people burning in hell with them? Why did only the antediluvians hear him preach? It also is senseless to suggest that Christ preached to the fallen angels who had been disobedient in Noah's day. While the spirits in prison are described as having been disobedient formally in uh, verses 19 and 20 of 1 Peter chapter 3, the Bible speaks of the evil angels as still disobedient today, as we read in Ephesians 6 verse 12. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this age, against spiritual hosts of wickedness in the heavenly places. And First Peter chapter 5 and verse 8. Be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary the devil walks about like a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour. Furthermore, the fallen angels are kept in darkness, bound with everlasting chains for judgment on the great day. We read in Jude chapter, well, it's only one chapter in Jude, and verse 6, without any opportunity of salvation. We should notice that in 1 Peter chapter 3, the spirits in prison of verse 19 are identified in verse 20 as the disobedient antediluvians in the days of Noah. The term spirit, Greek pneuma, P-N-E-U-M-A, is used in this text and elsewhere in the New Testament, as we read in 1 Corinthians 16-18 and Galatians 6-18, in reference to living people who can hear and accept the invitation of salvation. Let's read those two texts. Firstly, 1 first Corinthians chapter 16, verse 18, For they refreshed my spirit and yours, therefore acknowledge such men. And Galatians 6, verse 18, Brethren, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with your spirit. Amen. The expression in prison obviously refers not to a literal prison, but to the prison of sin in which the unregenerate human nature is found, as we read in two rather long passages. The first is Romans chapter 6, verses 1 to 23. What shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? Certainly not. How shall we who died to sin live any longer in it? Or do you not know that as many of us as were baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? Therefore, we were buried with him through baptism into death, that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in newness of life. For if we have been united together in the likeness of his death, certainly we also shall be in the likeness of his resurrection, knowing this, that our old man was crucified with him, that the body of sin might be done away with, that we should no longer be slaves of sin. For he who has died has been freed from sin. Now, if we died with Christ, we believe that we shall also live with him, knowing that Christ, having been raised from the dead, dies no more. 
death no longer has dominion over him. For the death that he died, he died to sin once for all. But the life that he lives, he lives to God. Likewise, you also reckon yourselves to be dead indeed to sin, but alive to God in Christ Jesus our Lord. Therefore, do not let sin reign in your mortal body, that you should obey it in its lusts, and do not present your members as instruments of unrighteousness to sin, but present yourselves to God as being alive from the dead, and your members as instruments of righteousness to God. For sin shall not have dominion over you, for you are not under the law, but under grace. What then? Shall we sin, because we are not under law, but under grace? Certainly not. Do you not know that to whom you present yourselves slaves to obey, you are that one slaves whom you obey, whether of sin leading to death, or of obedience leading to righteousness? But God be thanked, that though we were slaves to sin, yet you obeyed from the heart that form of doctrine to which you were delivered. And having been set free from sin, you became slaves of righteousness. I speak in human terms because of the weakness of your flesh. For just as you presented your members as slaves of uncleanness and of lawlessness, leading to more lawlessness, so now present your members as slaves of righteousness for holiness." For when you were slaves of sin, you were free in regard to righteousness. What fruit did you have then in the things of which you are now ashamed? For the end of those things is death. But now, having been set free from sin and having become slaves of God, you have your fruit to holiness and the end everlasting life. For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. And the other passage is Romans 7 verses 7 to 25. What shall we say then? Is the law sin? Certainly not. On the contrary, I would not have known sin except through the law. For I would not have known covetousness unless the law had said, you shall not covet. But sin, taking opportunity by the commandment, produced in me all manner of evil desire. For apart from the law, sin was dead. I was alive once without the law, but when the commandment came, sin revived and I died. And the commandment, which was to bring life, I found to bring death. For sin, taking occasion by the commandment, deceived me, and by it killed me. Therefore the law is holy, and the commandment holy and just and good." Has then what is good become death to me? Certainly not. But sin, that it might appear sin, was producing death in me through what is good, so that sin, through the commandment, might become exceedingly sinful. For we know that the law is spiritual, but I am carnal, sold under sin. For what I am doing I do not understand. For what I will to do, that I do not practice. For what I hate, that I do. If then I do what I will not to do, I agree with the law that it is good. But now it is no longer I who do it, but sin that dwells in me. For I know that in me, that is in my flesh, nothing good dwells. For to will is present with me, but how to perform what is good I do not find. For the good that I will to do I do not do, but the evil I will not to do that I practice. Now if I do what I will not to do, it is no longer I who do it, but sin that dwells in me. I find then a law that evil is present with me, the one who wills to do good. For I delight in the law of God, according to the inward man. But I see another law in my members warring against the law of my mind and bringing me into captivity to the law of sin, which is in my members. O wretched man that I am, who will deliver me from this body of death? I thank God, through Jesus Christ our Lord. So then, with the mind I myself serve the law of God, but with the flesh the law of sin." 
Christ's preaching to the impenitent antediluvians was accomplished through Noah, who was divinely instructed by God, as we read in 11.7 in Hebrews. By faith, Noah, being divinely warned of things not yet seen, moved with godly fear, prepared an ark for the saving of his household, by which he condemned the world, and became heir of the righteousness which is according to faith and became a preacher of righteousness to his contemporaries, as it says in 2 Peter chapter 2, verse 5. Peter's verses were written in the context of what it means to be faithful. They are not a commentary on the state of the dead. And 2 Peter chapter 2, verse 5 reads, And did not spare the ancient world, but saved Noah, one of eight people, a preacher of righteousness, bringing in the flood on the world of the ungodly. Thursday, November 24, The Souls Under the Altar Read Revelation chapter 6, verses 9 to 11. How can the souls of the dead martyrs cry under the altar? Let's read Revelation chapter 6, beginning at verse 9. When he opened the fifth seal, I saw under the altar the souls of those who had been slain for the word of God and for the testimony which they held. And they cried with a loud voice, saying, How long, O Lord, holy and true, until you judge and avenge our blood on those who dwell on the earth? Then... A white robe was given to each of them, and it was said to them that they should rest a little while longer, until both the number of their fellow servants and their brethren, who would be killed as they were, was completed. The opening of the fifth apocalyptic seal reveals an unusual scene. The souls of the martyrs were seen metaphorically under the altar, crying to God for vengeance in the text we've just read. Some commentators are inclined to identify this altar as the altar of incense mentioned under the seventh seal in Revelation 8 verse 6. Let's have a look at that one. Revelation 8, beginning at verse 1, When he opened the seventh seal, there was silence in heaven for about half an hour. And I saw the seven angels who stand before God, and to them were given seven trumpets. Then another angel, having a golden censer, came and stood at the altar. He was given much incense that he should offer it with the prayers of all the saints upon the golden altar which was before the throne. And the smoke of the incense with the prayers of the saints ascended before God from the angel's hand. Then the angel took the censer, filled it with fire from the altar, and threw it to the earth. And there were noises thunderings, lightnings, and an earthquake. So the seven angels who had the seven trumpets prepared themselves to sound. But the reference to blood instead of incense in Revelation 6, 9 to 11 leads us to see here an allusion to the altar of burnt offering where the blood of the sacrifices was poured. As we read back in Leviticus, Chapter 4, and first of all, verse 18, And he shall put some of the blood on the horns of the altar, which is before the Lord, which is in the tabernacle of meeting, and he shall pour the remaining blood at the base of the altar of burnt offering, which is at the door of the tabernacle of meeting. And verse 30, then the priest shall take some of its blood with his finger, put it on the horns of the altar of burnt offering, and pour all the remaining blood at the base of the altar. And verse 34. The priest shall take some of the blood of the sin offering with his finger, put it on the horns of the altar of burnt offering, and pour all the remaining blood at the base of the altar. As the blood of those sacrifices was sprinkled around the altar, so the blood of the martyrs was symbolically poured at God's altar when, by remaining faithful to the word of God and the testimony of Jesus, they lost their lives. And we read about them being faithful in Revelation 6 
and verse 9, and that read, When he opened the fifth seal, I saw under the altar the souls of those who had been slain for the word of God and for the testimony which they held. And then Revelation 12, verse 17, And the dragon was enraged with the woman, and he went to make war with the rest of her offspring who keep the commandments of God and have the testimony of Jesus Christ. And Revelation chapter 14 and verse 12 Here is the patience of the saints, here are those who keep the commandments of God, and the faith of Jesus. The souls under the altar are also symbolic. By taking them literally, one would have to conclude that the martyrs were not fully happy in heaven, for they are still crying out for vengeance. This hardly sounds as if they are enjoying the reward of salvation. The desire for vengeance can make your life miserable, but your death as well. Also, it's important to remember that John was not given a view of heaven as it actually is. There are no white, red, black or pale horses there with warlike riders. Jesus does not appear there in the form of a lamb with a bleeding knife wound. The four beasts do not represent actual winged creatures of the animal characteristics noted. Likewise, there are no souls lying at the base of an altar in heaven. The whole scene was a pictorial, symbolic representation. We read in the Seventh-day Adventist Bible Commentary, Volume 7, page 778. George E. Ladd, a non-Adventist, wrote, again sounding like an Adventist, In the present circumstances, and he quoting Revelation 6, 9 to 11, the altar is clearly the altar of sacrifice, where sacrificial blood was poured. The fact that John saw the souls of the martyrs under the altar has nothing to do with the state of the dead or their situation in the intermediate state. It is merely a vivid way of picturing the fact that they had been martyred in the name of their God. And that's from a commentary on the Revelation of John, page 103. And so to finish today, who, especially of those who have been victims of injustice, hasn't cried out for justice, which has not yet come? Why must we, by faith, Trust that ultimately the justice so lacking in this world will nevertheless come. What comfort can you draw from this wonderful promise? Friday, November 23. From the book Christ Object Lessons, page 260, we read, In the parable of the rich man and Lazarus, Christ shows that in this life men decide their eternal destiny. During probationary time, the grace of God is offered to every soul. But if men waste their opportunities in self-pleasing, they cut themselves off from everlasting life. No after probation will be granted them. By their own choice, they have fixed an impassable gulf between them and their God. End of quote. And from Testimonies to the Church, Volume 5, page 213, when those early Christians were exiled to mountains and deserts, when left in dungeons to die with hunger, cold and torture, when martyrdom seemed the only way out of their distress, they rejoiced that they were counted worthy to suffer for Christ, who was crucified for them. Their worthy example will be a comfort and an encouragement to the people of God who will be brought into the time of trouble such as never was. And that leads us to our four discussion questions for this week. 1. How can the overall biblical view of human nature help us better understand some of the passages we studied during this week? 2. Reflect on the contrast between the unnegotiable religion of the Christian martyrs and the flexible religion of our postmodern generation. In other words, what are things worth dying for? However, if one has a view that all truths are merely relative or cultural, then why die for any of them? 
At the same time, what can we learn from those who were willing to die for causes that we believe are false? 3. Dwell more on the parable of the rich man and Lazarus. When Jesus had been raised from the dead, many believed on him. Yet many, having the same evidence, didn't believe. What does this teach us about how hardened human hearts can be to truth? What can we do to protect ourselves from a similar kind of hardness? And four, Jesus talked about the time when the dead will live. Those who have done good to the resurrection of life and those who have done evil to the resurrection of condemnation, we read in John 5.29. These two events are a thousand years apart, even though they sound as if they were happening at the same time. How might this help us to understand what Paul is saying in Philippians 1 verse 23? For I am hard pressed between the two, having a desire to depart and be with Christ, which is far better. And now it's time for Inside Story with Sibylla. Thank you, Sibylla. Number one, God First by Ukraine Matengu. Modesty Kakula, a businessman in Namibia, has an unusual way of sharing Jesus. Slogans painted on his three cars declare number one, God First. Modesty's novel approach to mission outreach began when his first employer offered to sell him a car for 50,000 Nambian dollars, which is $4,000 US, in the town of Katima Mulilo. Modesty, two years out of high school and newly married, worked hard and managed to pay off all but 5,000 Nambian dollars, which is 400 US, in just four months. Then his employer changed his mind and priced the car at 60,000 Nambian dollars. Why are you changing the price just now when I'm about to finish paying for it? Modesty asked. A few months later, when Modesty had paid off all but 5,000 Nambian dollars, his employer increased the price to 70,000 Nambian dollars. Modesty tried to pay off the car again and, to his surprise, his employer then accused him of not making any payments. The case ended up in court and the judge ruled in favour of Modesty. But the employer furiously told the court, he will only get that car over my dead body. Modesty's wife, Rebecca, whispered to her husband and then asked to address the court. Weeping, she said, let him keep the car. God will make a way for us. The employer returned 22,000 Nambian dollars to Modesty and fired him. At home, Modesty, with no job or income, tearfully poured out his heart to God. As he prayed, he accidentally knocked his Bible to the floor. Picking up the open Bible, Modesty's eyes fell on Romans 8.28, which says, And we know that all things work together for good to those who love God, to those who are called according to his purpose. Wow! Modesty exclaimed as peace and assurance filled his heart. The next morning, the phone rang while Modesty was still in bed. An unfamiliar male voice offered to sell him a car for just 23,000 Nambian dollars. Modesty rushed to the man's house. Sure enough, a car was available for sale. At Modesty's pleadings, the man lowered the price to 22,500 Nambian dollars, and Modesty borrowed money from his parents to pay the balance. To testify to everyone about God's goodness, Modesty immediately painted the slogan, Number one, God first, above the rear window. Today, Modesty is an elder and business owner with three cars, each of which have the slogan above the rear window. Wherever his car goes, people point and say, God first. And God is always faithful. This lesson was read by Dr. Percy Harold for Christian Services for the Blind. 
Sponsored by the Sabbath School Department and distributed through Hope Channel Australia, this podcast is also redistributed by Hope Channel Germany, Christian Record Services for the Blind. It is also available on SoundCloud and through multiple podcast distributors, including Apple iTunes. And you can listen and watch at the same time on YouTube. Remember, God is always faithful.